Okay, so it's time for afternoon session. So in this afternoon session, Professor Takahiro will continue his lecture about uh, information thermodynamics. Okay, so let's welcome. Thank you. So yesterday, I have talked about uh, how Maxwell's demon affects thermodynamic systems and how it modifies the second law of thermodynamics by including information. So uh, today, next topic is how about the uh, thermodynamic property of Maxwell's demo itself? I mean, so far we have discussed uh, the thermodynamic property of the engine that is operated by Maxwell's demo. On the other hand, it is also a very important topic how we can understand uh, thermodynamics of Maxwell's demo itself. Actually, so this has a long history of discussions by many physicists, for example, by Brewer and Bennett and Randall. So they <coughs> proposed um, several scenarios how we can understand the consistency between Maxwell's demo and the second law of thermodynamics. Actually, the specific problem is that so we can extract a positive amount of work from this heat engine, like the Schrader engine. So on the other hand, we need a positive amount of work performed on the demo itself. So from the entire system, we cannot extract um, any positive amount of energy. And uh, Max's, the role of Max's demo is consistent with the second law of thermodynamics. But the problem is that exactly when and why this cost is needed for Maxwell's demo itself. So there are several proposals for this problem. And first, William proposed that a measurement process is important, and we always need some energy to perform the measurement uh, about the system. But after that, Bennett and Randall discussed that in principle, we don't need any energy to perform a measurement, and instead, we always need the energy to erase the information from the memory of the demo. So that is known as the Randall's principle, and it has been ac accepted as the key to understand the consistency between Max's demo and the second law of thermodynamics. So <laughs> today, I will briefly review these historical discussions, and after that, I will talk about a more modern scenario to understand the role of Maxwell's demo based on stochastic thermodynamics and mutual information. Okay, so this is a very old argument by Brera. So he considered that to perform a measurement about the position of the particle, for example, we need to shed a light to distinguish the position of the particle in the left box or right box. So in that case, the energy of the photon should be greater than the thermal radiation around this particle, because otherwise we cannot distinguish the probe photon from the background photon radiation. That means that the photon energy should be much larger than KT, and therefore the photon energy should be larger than KT log 2. So Brillian considered that this solved the paradox of Maxwell's demo because we need always much greater energy than the summer fluctuations. But the uh, problem of, of this argument is that this argument relies on very spe specific situation that we shape right on the particle and we distinguish the position of the particle. But in principle, we don't need to stick to this setup. But for example, we can use some more involved uh, setups, like we can use, for example, magnets to distinguish uh, the uh, position of the magnetized particle or something like that. Actually, it was the scenario that was considered by Randall and Bennett and they considered that if we design the measurement process very cleverly, then 
Uh, we don't need any energy in principle to distinguish the state of the engine. Yeah, uh, I don't go into the details of the argument, but basically they consider some some model of magnet. For example, this is a kind of ferromagnet, and we have two uh, potential barrels representing the upward magnetization and downward magnetization. And this is a target system like the engine. This is a kind of magnet heat engine. And a probe system is something like another magnet. Then uh, our purpose is how to copy this information stored in the magnet to the other magnet. That is, this magnet is regarded as a Mach system. So, neighbor is thinking we need some energy to copy that information here, but if we use some very soft potential as Mach system, so this is a kind of uh, a criticality of the phase transition of the magnet. Then the magnetization mode is now very flexible. So this information can be easily copied to here, in principle, without injecting any energy. So for example, if we set this another magnet here, and then if this is here, maybe the mode comes here. And after that, we can just change the potential of Maxwell demo like this. Then the copied information is fixed as this. So by using this kind of protocol, you can see that in principle, we don't need any energy to copy information. That means that we don't need any energy to perform a measurement. So that is the argument of Randall and Bennett. So now, in that sense, Brillant's argument is based on this specific setup. So then Randall and Bennett propose that, in principle, we always need the energy to erase the information from the memory. So again, this is a kind of a, some memory system, for example, represented by some magnet or something like that. And in this double wave system, we have information left or right with probability one half and one half. So this is the post measurement state. And uh, this information reflects the state of the system. Then if we want to use this memory again to, for another measurement, then we need to reset uh, this information. And the memory should be initialized to a standard state like this left state, we call it as zero. So, but for this information erasure process, uh, the entropy of the system, entropy of the memory is decreased by log two, because we have two options in the initial state, but after the erasure, we always have a state zero in the left side. So, that entropy of log two should be dissipated into the environment or the heat bus. So that requires some uh, work and the same amount of heat dispersion. I mean, sorry, so yeah, uh, I mean, log two of entropy is di dissipated into the heat bus. So the same amount of heat that is KT log two should be dissipated to the heat bus. So to compensate it, we need the same amount of work. So this is so-called the Randall's principle. So if we erase the information from the memory, then heat is generated to the environment and the same amount of work is required. So then we can consider that this is the key to resolve the Max's demo because, sorry, because we need a positive amount of work for the reset process of the memory of Max's demo. And that exactly compensates for the work extracted from the engine. And from the entire system, we can't extract any work. And there's a, there was an experimental demonstration 
it is. It was already 10 years ago, so by a group of Silbert. So uh, they actually demonstrated uh, the exact same protocol of the Landauer's thought experiment by using an uh, optical trap of a colloidal particle. And they demonstrated that uh, in the slow erasure limit, I mean, if we uh, take infinite time to erase one bit of information, then the required work on the heat dissipation it goes to the Landau's limit given by KT log 2. So, yes. Okay, so I mean, uh, I, agree, I agree with you that when we erase uh, memory, then we need some energy, yeah. work or heat dissipation. So, but isn't it same for when we write an energy? I mean, that after measurement, I mean, the, the daemon state should be changed depending yeah. on the measurement result. So yeah. it is kind of a writing a memory, but I think uh, writing a memory is probably essentially same as uh, erasing memory, then isn't it that we need another additional, I mean, uh, energy for that? Right? You mean, we need some additional cost for writing in information. So my, yeah, my question is that yeah. writing a memory probably essentially same as a erasing memory. Yeah. yeah, in some sense, yes. Yeah, actually, that's what I will talk about later. Oh. So yeah, from, yeah, based on more general formulation of information thermodynamics, uh, there's only a trade-off relation between the erasure cost and the measurement cost. Yeah, that, 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 that is the main topic <laughs> that I will talk later. But yeah, at this stage, this is a kind of a summary of historical argument. It was proposed in the 1980s, before the stochastic thermodynamics was established. So yeah, now we can consider a more general scenario to measurement and erasure. But anyway, so Okay, so this is a very nice experimental demonstration uh, to directly check the Landau's principle is indeed valid. Okay, so now it looks very good to have the uh, resolution of the paradox Maxwell's demon based on the Landau's and Bennett's argument. But again, this is a very old argument based on a sort of experiment like this. So now, but now we can formulate more general information processing processes uh, based on modern thermodynamics. So the, my question is, is this indeed the final answer or do we have more general think or more rigorous uh, formulation of information thermodynamics? Okay, so then before going to the main part, we can consider a slightly generalized situation. For example, in the Landau's Bennett scenario, we considered a symmetric memory like, like this. So in this case, the potential where are completely symmetric between state zero and state one. On the other hand, in general, we can consider a asymmetric memory in which we have different entropies and different energies for state zero and state one, like this. Actually, in our laptop computers, we have very highly asymmetric memories. And also in our cells, uh, memories are very asymmetric. Uh, that is a kind of a molecules or something like that. So in this situation, the point is that only by flipping the bit from zero to one, the energy is changed and also entropy is changed. And as a consequence, the free energy is changed. So this means that uh, there is uh, some free energy cost between the initial standard state and post-measurement state. Uh, that is written as delta F. Because for example, this Fm is the free energy associated with uh, the where m, m is the measurement outcome, m equals zero or m equals one, for example. And this F zero is the initial standard free energy. So if the memory is symmetric, this delta F is always zero because yeah, F1 and F0 are the same. But if the memory is asymmetric, then we have free energy difference just for trivial information processing processes. So from this point of view, we can 
consider this kind of measurement and erasure process. So in the measurement process, the initial state is zero and the free energy is, is F0. Then we get some measurement outcome K. Sorry, this was written as M in the previous slide, but anyway, so we have measurement outcome K and with probability PK. Then the free energy change is given by this uh, delta F. And after the measurement and maybe feedback, so we need to erase the information and the free energy change is given by minus of delta F. So th this delta F is relevant only for the erasure process. Then the Landers principle should be modified like this. So the erasure cost is bounded by the Shannon information in the original Landers principle with symmetric memory. But we need the free energy modification here uh, because in the asymmetric memory, just the free probes information requires some uh, free energy change. So we need some additional work cost. So in the case that the memory is symmetric, delta F is always zero. So the original Randall's principle is recovered. But if delta, is, delta F is not zero, um, we can even achieve the information ratio with uh, less energy cost than the conventional Randall's bound. So yeah, this was actually experimentally demonstrated by the group of John Beckhofer a few years ago. Sorry, I failed to cite their paper, but anyway, yeah. This is a yeah, very natural extension of the Randall's principle due to the role of asymmetry of the memory. So the main idea behind this uh, is uh, based on the uh, very general property of the decomposition of the channel information. So, for example, we consider this kind of asymmetric memory, and we consider the total Shannon entropy of the entire phase space. So, the, then we can decompose the total Shannon entropy into two parts. One is the Shannon information associated with the measurement outcome K, that is purely a, some kind of a logical Shannon information. So for example, if we store the information zero and one with probability one half and one half, then the, this logical channel information is given by row two. On the other hand, there's some internal uh, channel entropy inside each well, because uh, in real physical systems, particles go around here, and uh, it is, for example, summarized, and that kind of summer entropy is already inside each well. So that kind of internal entropy can be neglected if we consider the symmetric memory because uh, the change of the internal entropy is always negligible in that case. But if we consider this asymmetric memory, so the internal entropy indeed affects the final work cost because uh, this internal entropy is also related to the heat dissipation and the work requirement. So this is the yeah, idea behind uh, the generalized uh, Randall's principle. Okay, so yeah. Now that, that is a generalized Randall's principle for asymmetric memory. But, but maybe perhaps you might consider that it's not so fundamental because we only have the free energy modification term to the original Randall's principle. So, so in that sense, more fundamental um, thing is the energy cost needed for the measurement process. Yeah, this process is what's argued to be not important by Randall and Bennett. But if we consider a general measurement process, including some free energy change and also our measurement error, then the general lower bound for the work cost required for the measurement is given by this. So this minus KTH term is the Shannon information obtained by the measurement. And this delta F is again the free energy modification associated with the asymmetry of the memory. And we have this final term. So this is the most important term that is represented by the mutual information obtained by the measurement. So these three terms give the uh, general cost for the measurement. So you can, uh, yeah, sorry. So and uh, in the special case that 
delta f is zero, that is the memory is symmetric, and also the if the measurement is error-free and the channel information is equal to the mutual information, then the lower bound is just given by zero. So this zero is exactly the same as the Landau's Bennett argument, uh, as in this case. So yeah, in that sense, this inequality includes the conventional argument as a special case. But in general, we have these three uh, different contributions, and all together, it give, uh, they give the uh, raw band of the work cost. Yeah, and also it is interesting to compare this measurement cost with the erasure cost. So in the case of the erasure cost, we have plus, plus KTH minus delta F. On the other hand, in the case of the measurement cost, we have minus KTH plus delta F. So we have opposite signs here. And in addition, we have the additional KTI mutual information term only for the measurement process. This means that the erasure and the measurement are almost time reversal with each other, except that only in the measurement process, the external information is obtained uh, to the memory. So that effect of information, uh, information gain is uh, represented in this final term. So from this, we can uh, derive the a trade-off relation between the measurement cost and the work cost. So as I showed, so these terms are have opposite, have opposite signs, so they are cancelled out, cancelled out, and this new term only appears in the measurement process, comes to this final trade-off relation. And I emphasize that the original Landau's principle is here, and this term is finally eventually cancelled out with the measurement process. So, <laughs> and in the final trade of relation to the measurement and the wager, we only have the mutual information term instead of the channel information term. So, in that sense, this is the very general form of the work cost required for Max's demo. So, and also this includes uh, Bennett, Bennett's argument and Randall's argument as a special case. But in general, we have only a trade-off relation instead of uh, a specific work cost for erasure or measurement. And the lower bound is given by the mutual information that is obtained by the measurement. So in that sense, this is a kind of modern understanding how Max's demo is consistent with the second law of some dynamics. I would skip by example and yeah sorry yes yeah yeah uh, exactly right Yeah, so if I understand correctly your question, so uh, yeah, this, uh, to, uh, this, for example, the measurement and cost, measurement cost and erasure cost depend on the structure of the memory. It's asymm asymmetric. So if we change the structure of the memory, then the erasure cost changes. It can be negative, for example, or we can also change the measurement cost by changing the structure of the memory. It's asymmetric. But the lower bound is always given by the mutual information. That is totally independent of the structure of the memory. So that, that's a yeah, message of this story of relation. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, I just want to check my understanding. Oh, it's a free energy of the memory. Yes. So, yeah, this is just defined as, uh, yeah, for example, in this case, 
uh, this state zero has some uh, partial free energy. So that is defined as the partition function uh, defined only in this left well, for example. In that case, F0 and F1 are the same. But in this asymmetric case, we have different F0 and F1. So th that difference gives the free energy change like this. The questions? Okay, so yeah, yeah, so yeah, I, okay, now I wouldn't skip the example. So this is a very, very <laughs> simple example, but yeah. Okay, so this is a uh, model of a memory. And for example, this is a symmetric memory, and this is a asymmetric memory. Uh, the energy is degenerate, but we have different phase space volume for the left and right. And um, then we can also replace this double potential as a, as two boxes. So this is, looks very similar to the Schrad engine, but this is a memory of the demon itself. So we model the memory as just a, these boxes. So. We, we can control the ratio of the volume of these boxes and that reflects the asymmetry of the memory. So t, if t is one half, this is symmetric and if t is not one half, it is not symmetric. So, and we can directly calculate uh, the measurement cost uh, in this model. And for example, if the system and the memory is symmetric, then the measurement cost is zero, as in the Randall's Bennett argument. But if, for example, the t is given by four over five, then in this case, the measurement cost is kt rho two instead of zero. And also we can calculate the erasure cost. So if the memory is symmetric, again, it is given by kt rho two, but if the parameter t is given by four over five, then the erasure cost is just zero. So in, in any case, we have all, always uh, the saturation of the trade of relation. That means that the erasure cost plus the measurement cost always gives kt rho two. So in this sense, this is a kind of optimal measurement and erasure model. It is a very simple model, but we can change the structure of the memory and we can control the measurement cost and the erasure cost, but the sum of them is always given by KT root. So this is, I think, the simplest demonstration of uh, information erasure and the measurement with asymmetric memory. Yeah, so. So yeah, again, so I would like to emphasize that this mutual information term is exactly the same as the upper bound of the work that can be extracted by the Maxis demo. So this term is canceled out with the ex excess work obtained by the demo. So that, that can be regarded as the yeah, resolution of the paradox of Maxis demo. Okay, so, yeah, then I'd like to go to the next part that is a kind of automatic max cells demons. It, it's a kind of relevant to biological systems like automatic information processing in cells. But before that, so there are several concepts that are needed to be introduced. So then I, I first uh, talk about the entropy production. I, I think Professor Lee already talked about this, but again, I will talk about the concept of entropy production. On the other hand, my talk yesterday and today so far is based on the work on the free energy. But more general thermodynamics can be formulated based on the concept of entropy production. So I should introduce that concept first and then based on the concept of entropy production, I will reformulate 
information of thermodynamics again. And then by taking a kind of a continuous limit of that uh, formulation, then I will naturally get uh, the thermodynamic formulation of autonomous information processing. So th that is the story of this, uh, my, the remaining of my lecture. Okay, so then first I will introduce entropy production. Okay, so, so far we have focused on the work and the free energy. But it is not completely general because only when the initial state of the system is in summer equilibrium, we can consider the work and the free energy as a measure of dispersion. But in general, we, we can have some non-equilibrium initial state and also non-equilibrium final state. Then the, uh, this work on the free energy are not good measure of dispersion or reversibility. And instead, we need to introduce a more general uh, irreversibility measure that is called entropy production. So the definition of entropy production is based on these two terms. So we have the channel information change of the system. That is just the information increase in the system. And in addition, we have the heat term here. So this minus beta Q is regarded as the entropy increase in the heat bus. So this beta is the inverse temperature of the heat bus, and Q is the information, uh, Q is the heat flow from the bus to the system. So then this <coughs> delta S minus beta Q is regarded as the total entropy production in this uh, entire system, consisting of the system and the heat bus. Yeah, th this concept was first introduced in by Prigozhin, but now we have uh, the channel information term here instead of ordinary thermodynamic entropy. So in that sense, this is very applicable to uh, uh, information thermodynamic systems. So we write this, uh, we use this notation delta S of SV as a total increase or a total entropy production of the system. And only in the special case that the entire state is in summer equilibrium, this entropy production reduces to the difference between the work and the free energy. And we can also introduce a stochastic version of the entropy production. So, yeah. In general, we have some stochastic, classical stochastic system here, driven by some randomness of the heat bus. So the heat is a kind of random variable. It's a stochastic variable. Uh, correspondingly, we need to introduce a stochastic Shannon information term here. So this is a, a bit weird concept, but uh, we can just take this naive definition. Uh, minus log of P is a kind of stochastic version of the Shannon entropy. And now we have the difference between the stochastic Shannon entropy minus stochastic heat, and we call it as a stochastic entropy production. So this is very important to formulate the fluctuation theorem or Jarzinski equality in this uh, out of equilibrium situations. Again, so the entro stochastic entropy production reduced to the work on the free energy in the equilibrium case at the level of each realization of the randomness. And I think Professor Lee already showed this. So yeah, we have uh, generalized Jarzinski equality, that is called the integral fluctuation theorem uh, for this stochastic entropy production. So if we take the ensemble average of a exponential minus entropy production, then it is always given by one. So this is uh, almost the same as the Jarzinski equality, but we now allow uh, initial non-equilibrium distribution. And from this, by using the convex inequality, that is the n sense inequality, so we get the second row of some dynamics at the average level. That is given, that says that the average of the entropy production is always non negative. And again, as a special case, we can recover the Jarzinski equality if the initial distribution is summary equilibrium and uh, w, if W is a 
uh, stochastic quantity, and, and that is related to the ent stochastic entropy production. Okay, so this is a, just a short review of the concept of entropy production. And now we can apply this to information processing scenarios. Okay, so now, okay, our final goal is how to format the autonomous information processing with some bipartite systems. For example, in our cell, we have some target object that is a kind of a system, and there is a part that plays a role of Mach system. So we consider that kind of bipartite system, and we consider the information exchange between these two systems, and we formulate some dynamics of that kind of system. So in an abstract formulation, we have system X here and system Y here. Typically, for example, X is demo and Y is a system or vice versa. So, and as a specific setup, we consider the system here that evolves from time zero to tau, from X to X prime. Um, during that process, uh, system X exchanges information with system Y, but the state of the system Y doesn't change in time. So this is a, uh, uh, this is a simple, simplified setup, but this setup includes several important situations. And also we can take a kind of a continuous limit of this diagram. So uh, specifically, we have the initial Mutual information between x and y here, and x prime and y here. These are typical examples of this setup. So we have, for example, the measurement process like this. And the, in this case, the system x is a memory, and system y is the engine. So in this case, the initial correlation is zero because this is a measurement process. So the initial mutual information is just zero. And the final mutual information is given by log two because uh, log two of information is obtained by the memory from the Cillard engine. So during this measurement process, it is natural to support that the state of the engine does not change during the measurement, but only the memory it changes like this, yes. Yeah. So if you um, here you have taken the heat bar. Yeah. But if you, if I have some kind of active bar, then how to survive with that um, entropy production rate with the that beta inverse temperature term in that entropy production? Rate? Mean active bus means some yeah. bus with some any bus with the non equilibrium bus kind of. Oh, it's a broken detail balance or. Something. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I. Uh, temperature is not well defined. Yeah, that, that's an interesting setup, but n now we are not considering that kind of active bus, but we only consider the summer bus with some detailed, bar detailed balance or local detailed balance. Yeah, in that case, the property of the bus is determined by just a single parameter, that is temperature. But in more active or some detailed balance broken system, heat bus, so we need many parameters, I think, to characterize it. Yeah. Because it's a kind of non-Gaussian bus, I think, yeah. yeah. So in that sense, typically we have in mind it that this is a range bar system to variable range bar system, and each of them is driven by some summer noise that satisfies the fluctuation dispersion theory. Yeah, so, okay, so this is a measurement process. On the other hand, by the same diagram, we can consider the measurement uh, feedback process. So in this case, we should swap the role of the engine and the memory. And now X is the engine and the Y is the memory. So this, because this is a feedback process, in the initial step, we have a correlation between the system and the memory that is given by log two in this case. 
And after the measurement, uh, sorry, after the feedback, so we can extract log to work from this serial engine. And the final correlation, final mutual information is just given by zero. Because after the feedback, we don't have any correlation now. So in this sense, uh, both measurement and feedback are represented by, represented by this single triangle uh, diagram. But we need to swap the role of x and y from here to here. And this implies that uh, the time reversal of measurement process is actually the feedback process. So I think somebody asked me about the time reversal of feedback. So who was that? Oh, yesterday. Oh, yes. Yeah. So one way to understand the time reversal of feedback is just the information erasure. If we fix the memory state to a single value, but if, if we consider the entire variables, including the memory and the engine, then the time reversal of feedback is given by the measurement. So yeah, you can swap this right diagram to left diagram. So in that sense, the measurement and feedback are yeah, time reversal process with each other. And that's the reason why we have the mutual information term, both in the measurement process and the feedback process. OK, so now, OK, so then we can apply the total entropy production to this diagram. So this is just a very simple decomposition of the total entropy production. So we consider this time evolution process, and we have initial correlation given by this, and the final correlation given by this. And the entropy production in system X is given by delta Sx. This is a channel information change of X minus beta Qx. Q, Q is just a heat flow. Then <laughs> it is very easy to decompose the total entropy production as two parts. So the total entropy production of this xy system is given by the channel information of xy minus the heat of x. Because the heat of y is just zero because y does not evolve in time. Now uh, we can consider this uh, channel information term as the sum of the channel information of x and the mutual information term. So the total entropy production is decomposed into this uh, delta x, uh, delta s x p, and the delta i. Delta i is the mutual information change. So now we can replace the second row of some dynamics of the total system to this uh, inequality. So yeah, the second row is always true for the entire system, including the system and the memory. So the total entropy production is always non-negative. But if we extract entropy change only in the system X, then that entropy production is bounded by the mutual information change from below, because yeah, uh, the total channel information is the sum of the channel information of X and the mutual information. So that's a, yeah, this is a, this is a very simple inequality. But from this, we can reproduce uh, all of the inequalities that I have shown before, uh, including the measurement cost and the feedback cost. OK, so this is a case one. So this is a feedback process. So in this case, uh, we have the initial correlation that is, in general, given by <laughs> mutual information i. And we have, in general, some remaining correlation in the final step. Then by applying the general inequality here, we can derive that the work extraction is given by the free energy difference and the mutual information. So this is essentially uh, from the, this mutual information term. I mean, if this delta i is negative, then the entropy change in x can be negative as well. And the, in the feedback case, we have the initial correlation here, and the remaining correlation is, in general, smaller than the initial correlation. So the right-hand side is just negative. So the left-hand side can be negative. So this is exactly the same as this work expression. So we can extract the work more than the free energy change, and that is given by the additional mutual information term. 
Okay, so this is uh, the same as the work band that I have shown yesterday. Okay, so the case states the measurement cost. So in the case of the measurement, the initial correction is zero, and final correction is something the memory gets. So the mutual information change is just given by i, and i is the obtained information. So the entropy production in system X should be always positive. That cannot reach zero because of this additional information obtained by the measurement. So this i is the origin of the uh, work cost that is needed for the measurement process of the demo that I have shown today just uh, 30 minutes ago. So this is, this is a derivation of the result of the, about the measurement cost of Max's demo. And actually these two terms are a conventional bound. We, we can decompose it as the sum of the free energy and the channel information change. And this final term represents the information obtained by this measurement process. Okay, so now <laughs> we have again the same trade of relation. So we have this measurement cost. So this is slightly different from the slides that I have shown before, but essentially the same. So you can refer to this as the sum of channel information and free energy. So then final mutual information term from, uh, is from here. And we only have the trade of relation between the measurement and erasure cost. Okay, so this is the summary of this uh, formulation. In general, the entropy change in system X is bounded by the mutual information change between this initial correlation and the final correlation. And in the feedback process, essentially it is given by the right hand side is given by minus of i because the, in the feedback process, the mutual information is consumed to extract the work. On the other hand, in the measurement process, the correlation is formed and the positive amount of mutual information is obtained. So that is the positive entropy production and right hand side is given by i. So this symmetry of minus i and plus i is again a representation of the time reversal symmetry between the measurement and the feedback. So and eventually these minus i and plus i are canceled out with each other and the total system uh, satisfies the second law of thermodynamics. So this gives a unified formulation of measurement and feedback. So we have shown several inequalities yesterday and today for measurement process and erasure process and the feedback process. But all of them are represented by this single inequality if we consider the total entropy production of this diagram. So, okay. So this is, I think, the simplest way to understand the entropy balance of Max's demo and the uh, slider engine or some information heat engine. Now, so again, we can revisit the paradox of Max's demo. So, okay, so the problem was that in the case of the slider engine, we can extract KT log two of work from the system. Yes, yeah. So, uh, when you start uh, this discussion, so, mm. I mean, you draw this schematic diagram. So, mm. there are two, there are two system, y, X system, Y system. Mm. So, you draw, I mean, in the schematic, you draw the X system is connected to one bed and the Y system is connected to other bed. Yeah. But in this format, it's actually Y is just a fix. I mean, it seems like the Y is not connected to any band. Oh, exactly so, right, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, is there any reason why you draw in that way? Oh, yeah, no, there was no reason, sorry. <laughs> it was just redundant. So, yeah, we don't need this bus, yeah. But in reality, we have some bus for Y. So, yeah, that, that is the motivation that I put heat bus here. So, the question is. Yes. 
Oh, yes, we can suppose that they are contacting with different temperature buses. Yeah, in that case, everything is almost the same, but we need to generate the entropy production in the presence of two reservoirs. Yeah, so. In the case of a single reservoir, the entropy production is, now we write it, sigma entropy production is delta S minus beta Q. So what if there are several reservoirs, for example, one and two, then we have beta one Q1 and beta two Q2. So yeah, of course we can consider three or four reservoirs. So th this is a general entropy production representation. And the same argument can be applied to this kind of situation. Yeah, so, so in that sense, we can attach different passes to the memory and the engine. And no, nothing will change fundamentally. Okay, so, yeah, now, okay, so now the question of entropy production is, uh, question of Max's demo is, is the entropy production of the zeroed engine is actually negative, that is given by minus of log two. This is corresponding to the excess work extracted by the demo, KT log two, and it's representation of entropy production, this is minus. So the original problem was that what compensates for the entropy decrease here? And yeah, the argument that I have been discussing is that uh, the mutual information change uh, compensates for it. Actually, if we take into account the mutual information as a part of entropy production, then it compensates uh, for this minus two because yeah, the total entropy production is given by the sum of the entropy change in the system and the mutual information. And in this case, the mutual information change is given by log two. So we have minus log two plus log two. That is just zero. So in this case, in the case of the zero engine, so the apparent entropy production was, positive, was negative, but if we appropriately sum the mutual information term, then everything is fine and the total entropy production is just zero. So yeah, this is very simple and almost trivial understanding uh, of how Max's demo is consistent with the second row of sum dynamics. Okay, and at, at this point, so I'd like to emphasize the difference between the logical reversibility and the sum dynamic reversibility. So this is a kind of a historical stuff. So I think Bennett first considered that the connection between the logical reversibility and sum dynamic reversibility. And in his terminology, logical reversibility means that the initial logical state can be recovered from the final logical state. For example, the, just a bit flip is a logically reversible process because zero becomes just one and one becomes just zero and we can recover the initial state trivially. On the other hand, information erasure process is logically irreversible. It's not reversible because uh, initial state is zero or one and final state is zero. So we can never recover the initial uh, logical state. So this is the concept of logical reversibility. And uh, from our point of view, the logical reversibility means that uh, uh, Shannon entropy of the system is not changed because uh, this uh, system, I mean, in this context, it's a memory, but the channel information of the memory is not changed. Because in this case, for example, we have row two of information in the initial state, and we have zero entropy, logical entropy in the final state. So the entropy change is minus row two. So information erasure is not reversible. So yeah, um, logical, reverse, logical reversibility is connected to the channel information change of the system. 
On the other hand, uh, there is a concept of thermodynamic reversibility. So that is uh, how the entire system, including the heat bus, is reversible. And from the point of view of the second law of thermodynamics, uh, the thermodynamic reversible process has the zero entropy production. So for example, if you expand the box uh, of a gas, then uh, and if it's very slow and cost static, uh, usually this is satisfied and it's a, just a reversible expansion of gas or something like that in conventional thermodynamics. So, and we can see that they are completely different concepts. So for thermodynamics, we need to add the heat term here and the channel entropy change minus heat term is zero. So that's a thermodynamic reversibility. On the other hand, the logical reversibility is just about the memory state. And so there, are, yeah, there are of course different concepts. So there's no logical relationship between logical reversibility and thermodynamic reversibility. So we can say that the information erasure is logically irreversible, but it can be done in some dynamic some reversible way. Because if the information erasure is very slow, then this delta S is minus log two and Q is log two, so this entropy production is zero. But the channel information alone is decreased. So yeah, that's the difference between logical reversibility and the thermodynamic reversibility. Okay, so now we have several key observations to understand the consistency of Max's demo with thermodynamics. So, by concerning the concept of total entropy production, Max's demo is always consistent with the second law of thermodynamics for measurement and feedback processes individually. So we don't need to consider a erasure process or something like that if we appropriately consider or define the total entropy production. So for that purpose, the mutual information is very important because the sum of the ordinary entropy change and the mutual information term is the total entropy production. So once we consider that concept, we always have the consistency with the demand the uh, second row of thermodynamics. So that, that is, I think, the simplest way to understand Maxwell's demand products. Okay, so I think I'm going faster than I expected. So do you have any questions or comments? Yes, yeah. The, the explanation about logically Oh yeah, this one. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, the erasure process is erasure process is zero and one becomes zero always. So this is in terminology of uh, mathematics, it's not bijection. Bijection, yeah, bijection. It's not bijection. That means uh, we can recover the original state from this final state. On the other hand, for example, just a not to get, this is a bit flip. Zero becomes one, and one becomes zero. So this is completely reversible. So and in this erasure process, the so entropy is changed because delta S is minus rho two. And in this not process, delta S is of course zero. So in that sense, the logical reversibility is completely characterized by the channel information change of the system. On the other hand, in the case of thermodynamics, the, the entropy production is given by delta S minus beta Q. And in the case of the Landers erasure process, so delta S is minus log two, and this is plus log two because heat is dissipated. So then now we have zero entropy production. So this means that uh, if you perform the information erasure very slowly, there's no 
entropy production or irreversibility, and uh, everything is yeah, fine. So, yeah, the difference between this logical reversibility and the thermodynamic reversibility is the presence of this heat term. So, this is a, this represents the change of entropy in the heat bus. So, if we drop this, it's just a logical reversibility, but thermodynamic reversibility is connected to the total entropy production, including the bus. So, is that the answer to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Question, are there um, finite time, uh, finite time, is that ending, which is actually double? Oh, you mean some theory for finite time? Yeah, for finite time, theory for finite time. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, there are recently many papers about finite time thermodynamics. So some of them are about the uh, uh, finite time Randall's erasure, for example. Yeah, so Randall's erasure is, is just a special case of general thermodynamic process. So we can apply some finite time thermodynamics concept, like a speed limit or thermodynamic concept relation to that kind of setup. So, yeah, and yeah, so we can derive some modif uh, the additional term associated with the finite timeness of the operation. Uh, I think exactly uh, there is a paper, its title is exactly Finite Time Randall's Principle by, I think, Beckhofer, John Beckhofer's group, I think, yeah. But I'm not sure about the finite time zeroed engine so far, but yeah, that, yeah, there might be that kind of paper. Okay, so we have uh, plenty of time for discussion or question. Maybe I a little bit talk about the next se section, and maybe then we go to break. So officially, we still have ten minutes, right? Sorry? Uh, officially, we have still have ten minutes for this lecture. Yeah, so okay, okay. So I will continue if there are no other questions. Oh yes. You, oh, no, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, well, why, do, why do we need to consider uh, logically, logical reversibility other than uh, thermodynamic reversal, reversibility? What, what is the importance of the logical reversibility? I'm not sure. So historically, so there was some argument that connects logical reversibility and thermodynamic reversibility. But that was actually not accurate. So yeah, of, of course we can define the concept called logical reversibility and use that for some computational analysis or something like that. But in the context of some dynamics, there are different concepts. Uh, yes, I think so. So in quantum computation, if there is no measurement, then it's all unitary. So it's automatically logically, logically reversible, I think. Yeah. But if we perform the measurement, it's a reversible process. Yeah. yeah. argument because if I do classical or classical yeah. mechanics in Hamiltonian yeah. framework right Hamilton uh, Poisson brackets mm. that's also unitary evolution right and if yeah. I naively do d rho dt so that mm. has to be something more fundamental than that right than the unitary you mean it, yeah yeah because it's also classical is also unitary yeah 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 exactly right? so, so yeah. why is quantum different uh, I think there's no fundamental difference okay, between okay. classical yeah, and yeah, yeah, quantum okay. in yeah, that yeah. prospect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, if there are no 
other questions? Maybe I will continue and then, yeah. Then we are going. To. If you stop here and then you, you want to continue the next session, then you can do it. But if you want to continue, then you Oh, maybe if I continue, then maybe I will finish all the lecture area. So, <laughs> maybe, yeah. I think it's not a bad idea to continue now 10 minutes and then go to break. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, final section is about auto autonomous max cell demons. So, yeah, so far I have been focusing on some very classic setup with just a single measurement and single feedback. That was the original setup of max cells demon. But, Nowadays, we can consider more, more complex setups. For example, if we look at our cells, there are several molecules and they play the role of Maxwell's demon. Then in that case, we need to formulate a kind of continuous monitoring and continuous feedback uh, going in the cell. For example, yeah, if we consider this kind of bacteria, so there's a ligand molecule around this bacteria, and that information is transmitted to um, this motor. And this bacteria can filter out, can filter out the external noise around here, and uh, that filtering is done by this feedback loop inside the cell. So in this kind of system, so for example, we can imagine that there is a Max's demo, and inf information is flowing continuously, and feedback is uh, also performed continuously. So to formulate this kind of situation as a thermodynamic process, so we need to introduce uh, some another or more generalized formalism of information thermodynamics by incorporating the concept of a continuous information flow. So I think this is also relevant to some artificial setup. Uh, of nanomachines and nanodevices. But anyway, so first I will formulate uh, autonomous, autonomous information processing processes. There is no external control and measurement of the feedback are continuous in time. Okay, so again, I'm going back to the standard setup. Here's a system and here's a heat bus and here's the channel information. And uh, again, the total entropy production is uh, given by this. So I slightly changed the notation. Now we have the total entropy production that is given by uh, sigma, capital sigma. And that is given by the channel information change and the heat flow. And again, this is a reminder. So the, in the presence of a single feedback and measurement, the lower bound of the system uh, of the entropy production is given by the minus of the mutual information. And we also have the fluctuation theorem here. And we can introduce the stochastic entropy production, and it gives always one if we take the ensemble average of exponential. And again, this is a reminder. So if we introduce the concept of stochastic mutual information, and if we include it in the ensemble average, then we have the fluctuation theorem uh, by using the Mutual information modification in the presence of Max system. Now, what we want to do is uh, how to quantify continuous information flow instead of the snapshot mutual information, and how to relate it to the second law, and how is it relevant biophysics. So, this is uh, the topic of the remaining talk. And actually, there are several approaches uh, to this. A problem, and one is a so-called information flow approach. So both are information flow, but th this is the information flow. So this was introduced by Jordan Horowitz and Massimiliano Esposito, and uh, this is this gives a stronger form of the second law of thermodynamics in Markovian dynamics, but it's not applicable to non-Markovian systems. On the other hand, I and Soskato have introduced a transfer entropy approach that is applicable to non-Markovian dynamics, but it gives a weaker second row. It's a, it's a kind of a loose inequality in the Markovian limit. So both are, have some merit and demerit. So 
if, I, if time allows, I will talk about uh, both of them. But today, I, I will start with this information flow approach because it's, I think it's more standard to treat this problem. OK, so now the setup is like this. So we consider some bipartite Markov jump processes. We have two variables, x and y. And probably x uh, plays a role of Max's demo, and y is the system, or vice versa. So uh, the total system is described by this master equation, and w is the transition matrix. And an important assumption is that uh, this dynamics is called bipartite. That means that variable x and variable y don't change at the same time. For every infinitesimal time step dt, only one of x or y will jump. So that is the assumption of this bipartite condition. And under this assumption, so we can introduce the probability flow of each system, x and y. This is written as jx and j y y prime. So this bipartite property is a kind of a strong assumption, but in many realistic situations in, for example, biological systems, this kind of assumption is satisfied. Uh, for, it, yes? I, I don't really understand what's the motivation for this. I mean, other than making it easier to analyze? Uh, you mean bipartite motivation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one motivation is that a broad class of biological systems can be described by bipartite system. I, I don't know. What okay. broad <laughs> class of biological systems is described? It is understood well enough to say that it has the bipartite property. Actually, the main motivation is that it's theoretically easy to treat. I, know. I yeah. understand that. I just want to understand. I mean, I do biological modeling, and I don't know any biological system that's understood well enough Okay. Yeah, uh, I think the most intuitive example of a bipartite system is a two-dimensional Langevin system with two particles. And if the noise, Langevin noise of these uh, systems are independent with each other, then it can be regarded as a kind of bipartite system. So it's this is a theoretical thing. yeah. <laughs> so but it, it's natural. Okay, so yeah, but it's natural. I think so. In our cells, for example, or for example, in this bacteria, sorry, so in this bacteria, so there are two, yeah, two parts. One is, the, for example, the methylation level, and the other part is the kinase activity. So if they are well separated inside the cell, so the noise uh, of these systems can be regarded as independent. So that's the motivation of uh, bipartiteness. Of course, if they are very close spatially, then yeah, the noise can be yeah, corrected. But, yeah. but those are open systems. I mean, you can't yeah. even think of these in your formulation because they're really open steady states, right? Chemical open systems. I, I don't even yeah. think you can formulate chemotaxis in this yeah. way. Yeah, it can be steady state. Yeah. Uh, but, but, uh, but, uh, there can be a. I mean, studied this system a lot. Okay. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, there can be a class of bipartite and no equilibrium steady state. Yeah. So uh, that, that, that's possible. So, yeah. Yes. Is there uh, erasing process in this system? Uh, sorry. Erasing, erasing process? Uh, this. Uh, actually, no. So uh, I talk about it later. But so yeah, in this case, measurement and feedback are performing in parallel. And we can clearly separate the measurement process and the erasure process. So yeah, as I, so if we go back to this triangle schematic, so it is not essential to separate the measurement process and feedback process. There's just a trade operation. So yeah, from now I will not particularly separate these processes, but we just consider just our autonomous uh, process described by master equation. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. 
Okay, so anyway, maybe I would stop here and yeah, we start in 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. okay, so uh, okay, now let's start, start the lecture here and then we will resume the lecture for, okay? So we will have a 15 minute break. <laughs>